Hello, Viram. How are we this afternoon? Welcome to our RegTech Matters event on the implications of generative AI on the RegTech ecosystem. In the spirit of reconciliation, the RegTech Association acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend, extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Since 2020, we've had over 19,500 people from 85 plus countries attend our programs. That includes today's event, which attracted 233 registrations from 27 countries. So thank you for joining us from wherever you are today. Before we jump into today's event, I wanted to give you an update on our industry perspectives report for 2023. This annual data collection is critical to the association as it helps us to pick at trends and identify opportunities and pain points. It also enables us to compare the current environment from the previous year to see how the ecosystem is performing in a range of significant areas, including the acceleration of adoption of RegTech. I wanted to thank everyone that contributed to the survey and we look forward to presenting with you our analysis later this year, so keep an eye out for that event. We have made some changes to our RegTech events this year, our RegTech Matters program in particular. We introduced an invitation only round table where we bring key stakeholders together to discuss a certain focus area. The content that is generated during this round table is then used to develop a wider ecosystem event, such as the one you are attending today. I'd like to thank our roundtable participants whose contribution has paved the way for what our panellists will be speaking about today. The event will be recorded and every registered delegate will receive the link, cameras and mics off please, and feel free to add questions in the chat. The panel will endeavour to answer them, time permitting. There will also be some polls that come up now and then, and we appreciate your responses. I'd like to now hand over to our moderator, Rachel Greaves. Rachel is a CIP, CISA, CISM, CDPSE, say that all very quickly, four times, mm -hmm. and is certified in project, change and records management. With a cultural anthropology and linguistics background, Rachel brings ethical, global and sustainable practices to the sector. She is Australia's most outstanding woman in IT security and RegTech Female Entrepreneur of the Year 2022, and is listed on the Women in Fintech Power List. Rachel will be introducing the rest of her esteemed panel. Over to you now, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Hi, everybody. It's so good to uh, be online with you all today. Thank you again for the introduction um, and thank you for the support for these kind of programs, RegTech Association. Um, we're all very grateful to have access to this kind of expertise. Um, today, we uh, are going to go through some discussion points some topics that uh, you will have seen in the um, uh, event invites, uh, but we'll keep the conversation fairly free flowing. So please um, add your questions and your contributions to the chat as we go. I'll keep an eye uh, across that um, as we proceed. What I'm going to do is quickly introduce our three um, uh, panelists uh, and then we'll jump straight into some questions. So um, first, and I'll get you to just give a little wave if you don't mind when I introduce you so people can see you there. First is uh, Mike McHugh. So Mike is um, representing Adobe on the meeting today. He set up a very cool background just before the meeting, uh, which I will get him to explain to you how he did that and what the process is. Um, Mike actually is a, is a designer by background and illustrator and author um, and a leader for digital media at Adobe in Australia. So he leads the uh, solutions consulting team um, uh, at that company and he's been a senior product manager for Creative Cloud. So he's been based in the US uh, and now in Australia, I understand. Is that right, Mike? Yep, great. Based um, in Melbourne, that's right. Oh, yep. Very nice, mm. very nice. 
Um, OK, perfect. Uh, next we have Steve Eutropoulos. So uh, Steve is from um, Microsoft. He's been working with Microsoft since the late 90s, uh, which, is a, which is a long time. So obviously he's um, loving that company and loving that opportunity to provide the kind of capability that his team does. So uh, he's the um, client CTO in the enterprise group at Microsoft and oversees the tech relationship with strategic customers, um, focusing particularly at the moment on generative AI and its impact. He's previously supported the development of the cloud and SaaS capabilities at Microsoft as well. So let's have a wave. Steve, where are you there? There you are. <laughs> perfect. OK, perfect. And then uh, we have Anthony Burrows from NAB. So um, Anthony is the head of innovation for NAB Group, and he um, focuses on solving complex financial services problems using the best emerging technology and partners. So he's um, very interested in the ecosystem around generative AI in particular. Uh, he spent um, 25 years in this career, and the first half of that spent founding and working in digital innovation startups across various industries. And he's been at NAB for nine years and counting, working in channel development, um, digital and NAB ventures uh, as well. So um, hello to you, Anthony. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just get started discussing some of these questions. But first, I wanted to just respond to the poll results. So the poll has come up about um, priorities um, for our attendees uh, for reg tech seeking to export. So we've got 48% um, of the focus here on Oceania, which for our global audience, um, you know, we, we sometimes have a preponderance of Australians register for these events because the reg tech association is born and bred in Australia as a uh, uh, all of us, I believe, on this call, many of us. Um, so that's obviously a key priority. And that's um, presumably New Zealand as a key market, which is also a, a, a fairly regulated market in terms of artificial intelligence, quite similar to Australia. Uh, but the next focus after that looks to be the Europe and UK. And that's actually where I am, which is why it's a bit dark um, and ominous here where I'm sitting um, here in London. Um, so we'll keep that in mind as we go through the discussion because these markets uh, are introducing legislation and regulation around ethical AI um, in different um, flavours and formats. Um, and that'll be a topic that is something that we'll all need to consider and address whether we are a um, services provider or a software provider or a consumer uh, to that point. We've got another poll popped up here. Please go and fill that one in. Um, I'm sure you can all rank that a five if you'd like to. OK, now let's uh, get started on some of these questions. So the first question that we wanted to work through with the panel um, and get contributions from the attendees on the call as well is about ensuring a focus on quality and trustworthiness of content. I think it's 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 um, accepted now and it's understood that AI, particularly generative AI, is a part of our business operations. It may become a part of the operations very quickly, faster than a lot of us thought it might, but it's unavoidable now that in some in some way, in some context, we'll be using artificial intelligence across our enterprises. Um, so we've always had challenges with information, uh, the volume of information that we have to create and capture and manage and the variety of that information and the velocity of change. That's been a longstanding problem for enterprises to deal with the implications of the privacy and security and quality of that information. But um, what many people are concerned about with the introduction of generative AI capability is a new V um, or a new focus on a, uh, an existing V, um, which is veracity. So how do we make sure that this information has the quality, has the trustworthiness, has the validity that we need to rely on? I'd like to actually go to you, Mike, first to talk about this, if you don't mind. Adobe has an AI ethics principles framework and has for some time. So perhaps mm -hmm. you can tell us a bit about that after you tell us about the giant eyeball that you've set up behind you. <laughs> yes, uh, it's a I, I thought it was appropriate for our uh, meeting <laughs> today. Um, <clears throat> but a really good question. I'll, I will probably speak to this, you know, for my part, um, through the lens of 
what Adobe do best around AI and our area of expertise, which is imaging, really. So we're talking about digital imaging, digital video documents, et cetera, um, like this. So um, when I think about trustworthiness um, and AI, I think about, and we think a lot about at Adobe, um, misinformation and disinformation on the internet, uh, deep fakes, et cetera, these types of a sort of nefarious activities that can happen online, misleading, you know, type imagery uh, that we see surfacing from time to time. We've been thinking about this for for a long time, at Adobe, um, being the um, being the sort of Photoshop company. Uh, digital imaging has been part of our sort of core uh, priorities for many many years. <clears throat> so, actually, a number of years ago. Uh, we helped found the Content Authenticity Initiative. There's a few different ways you can think about this. There's sort of a detection um, approach that you can have. Can we detect if something is a um, has been generated with an AI model or, you know, is that image being generated with AI or parts of it? Um, and it's a very difficult game to win. It's kind of like a dog chasing its tail, um, you know, trying to catch up with the models themselves, you know, so we just ourselves, ourselves release a Firefly 2 model. It's a greatly advanced model. It's more, you know, going to be difficult for people to detect, to detect images that have been created with that. So a number of years ago, we helped found the Content Authenticity uh, Initiative. Um, it runs off the C2PA standards, an open text standard. Microsoft are on that uh, board as well. It's an independent organisation um, that talk about or really focus on the provenance of where uh, an image or a video or a document comes from so that that is easily traceable by the viewer or the person consuming that content to be able to go back and say, where did this originate from? Oh, actually, it's an artificially um, uh, generated image, um, and I'm okay with that. I, I understand because um, whoever's created this has been really transparent about the way that um, that, that has been done. So um, the Content Authenticity Initiative, you can think about it a lot like a digital nutrition label for content that's that's online or, or elsewhere. We can um, click on a little icon or we can run it through the Verify website and we can see what generated that image, what changes have been made to it after it's been generated. Um, and then that way we kind of can allow organisations, companies, brands, um, to present themselves to their customers in a very authentic way. Say, so, oh, if we're making changes to an image then, or we're using AI generated images, then we're gonna be really open and transparent about that. Mm. Um, so then it, it, it allows people that are wanting to do the right thing, uh, wanting to present their brand in a very positive way, they're able to do that and, and um, really have the trust of their customers and their audience. And, I, and that's really important to us. Yeah, so like the blue check mark of generative AI, you know. Yes, except it's a little CR icon with like a little talking bubble thing. Yes. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. we've we've always had an issue with fakes um, ever since you know the invention of photography and probably ventriloquism um, at an earlier stage, <laughs> um, forging yes. signet rings to press into the wax. Um, so I think one of the concerns that people have around generative AI is that, yes, people can um, can can self-certify and say, yes, I use generative AI as part of this process. Uh, but we've seen that happen before with what we now call greenwashing, you know, where people are just taking the opportunity to say, you know, this this content I've generated is gluten free. Yeah, it's water. You know, of course, it's gluten free. Mm. Yes, it's yes, it's uh, generated with with AI. Um, do you you think at some point when we have so much content being generated in this way and everybody doing it that the value of that check mark kind of fades away um when, when everybody's doing it is is it still something that we would be discussing and caring about at that point or will society kind of become acclimated to the idea that everything you see everything you touch might actually uh, be generated by a machine well i think that's uh, that's another really great 
a question if I can if I can do that. I mean, our intention or or the content authenticity uh, is intention is to become ubiquitous. So everyone mm. does do it. Now there can be images actually Leica cameras is a very popular brand of cameras just released their first model of camera that has those content credentials built directly into the camera so mm -hmm. that it's not an AI generated image at all. It's actually for all content. So this image that was taken, say, of a political figure, let's say, for argument's sake, mm -hmm. has been completely untouched. And so yeah. then, you know, a large media organisation can present that to the world and say, well, here's actually what happened. It hasn't okay. been retouched. So while we talk about AI images, you know, being tagged and Firefly automatically tags our images um, with content credentials so that anything coming out of that will will be tagged. Um, it's not just for AI generated images, we're all imagery because we know mm. retouching has been around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. As you say. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, very interesting point. Um, mm. Steve, can I come to you to talk a little bit about our next question? And, and I just want to sort of segue into this one about um, AI in the private domain versus the public domain. A lot of this technology has been around a long time, but it's only been in the zeitgeist since it hit the public domain, you know, since, since you know, your average Joe suddenly was exposed to this kind of capability and adopted it really rapidly. Obviously, we've seen really steep uh, inflection curves in the adoption of these new technologies once they're available in the public domain. And these are technologies that have been brought into the public domain by foreign states, you know, so whereas we used to have maybe um, the US particularly and the UK bringing new technology that's disruptive into the market, you know, like Microsoft, for example, like like Adobe, um, now we have this kind of AI technology entering the public domain and it's coming from different backgrounds and different nations, which is quite a different, um, you know, outlook, I guess, on the future of where this technology will come from and how it will cross public and private. So it's kind of a hairy, broad question, mm. but I think it would be good to get your kind of unfiltered take on that uh, to start with. Yeah, and it's um, it's an important question because when I um, uh, I was listening to, to Sam, Sam Altman actually recently just on this very question, um, and a lot of people have been, you know, there's this debate you know, of should this really have been continuing inside, you know, advanced labs, keep working with the models and then release them once safety has been sort of insured and and have been wrapped around with cotton wool and, and so on. Uh, you know, and, and Sam's view, and I guess this is kind of the view that I think OpenAI has been pushing for and the others have followed through on, um, mm -hmm. is that, by putting this into the public domain, it creates a dialogue. And it's about time we had this dialogue because yep. it needs a concerted global effort where you've got the big techs with the labs and the governments and uh, it, you know academia coming together and having a very important dialogue that if we left this being kind of developing on their own, these dialogues may not get to the point where we need to be to create that safety we need. So now we hear the UK putting forward a governance framework. Uh, Joe Biden signed an executive order today. You know, we've been in the yeah. White House. Uh, I think Adobe's been involved in that. It's, uh, we've, um, we're creating a forward leaning uh, position, if you like, with the other labs, uh, with the, um, uh, what we call the Frontier Forum, Fr Frontier Model Forum. Because so we're sort of moving away from language models now as a definition to models that are actually, you know, I think the recognition here is just language happens to just be the one data type we have been training these on now of yeah. obviously images now um, and then as we start moving into anything from IOT uh, signals to anything from mm -hmm. you know music you know that predictive nature but the emergent uh, it's it's there's there's certain some sort of emergent reasoning coming out of that uh, whether it's pattern matching whether it's just the, the statistical flow of the latent space when you do your you know your queries there is certainly more than just prediction going on so that dialogue um, we feel is a positive sign that we are starting to deal with this in a more mature way. Probably in a, in a, in a, it will, you know, if I had to sort of forecast where it will go, and this is generally a uh, common consensus, but it's not maybe the official one, but it is the common consensus that we probably will use, um, converge on some sort of global 
entity uh, to maybe under the UN or it might be under uh, a, a different sort of format, which will form you know governance as core heuristic principles. So, so that's that's kind of the public domain. Now, the private domain will continue to go, you know, and and keep mm -hmm. moving. Um, and then you look at that interaction between the, you know, the private, um, I guess, the private acceleration, and it's an interesting to see where the, the play is because there's a lot of uh, concern. For example, you know, there's uh, the ability to train a model. Um, outside of the jurisdiction of these uh, governance frameworks and how how do we control them how do we put uh some sort of uh, limiting factor into the into the data or into the the way these models are trained that actually becomes a safety net now that's that's a lot of research going on in there and i was just talking to someone today um you know microsoft and i'm sure others are doing this the same thing you know we're funding a significant amount of uh, programs uh right now in academia to focus on you know, inherent safety uh, mm -hmm. in the models. And also the reverse is the uh, data poisoning problem that's starting to sort of emerge, right? It's yeah. like, yes, you've got this model that's been trained, but someone has maliciously put content into that data, which can be activated by a prompt, um, which then sort of re recreates some malware, right? And that's being done in labs. We, we know that it's possible. Um, so the, the, the key thing is, could we get the right research? Could we write the right tooling and the technology for models that are trained with the to make them effective are also still governed in some sort of safety net way so yeah a bit of a long answer but i think the general direction of a global governance and uh which a, com a combination of all actors we're glad that things are moving on in that direction let's put it that way yeah yeah, yeah. i think um broadly it, you know it's there's obviously been some controversy there's been um some you know, noise um, in the market that a, a lot of the big vendors uh, don't want to be regulated and see regulation as stymieing progress. But I think it's pretty clear from your description and from, you know, from others that the consensus, the broad consensus in the commercial community is that regulation of AI is appropriate and is is going to be important and is going to be vital. I think just to, just to wrap up this um, part of the conversation and move into the trust premium discussion, government has has traditionally maybe lagged uh, the private sector in terms of adopting technology and being at the at the leading edge of the, of the bell curve, um, but in this case maybe maybe government won't have that luxury so much anymore. And we're already seeing, for example, defence strategic strategies in the UK switch to a much more forward focused leading um, mentality of making sure they're they're adopting innovation and working with academia and working with industry, exactly as you just said, to make sure they're not kind of left behind yesterday's technology tomorrow. You know, so um, perhaps you can kind of give us a, a, a very quick picture of how you think government is um, is is going to take forward this idea of, of being at the cutting edge. And then, Anthony, we might come to you to talk about what that means in, in practice uh, as a trusted brand um, such as the one that you represent. I, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, so so continuing on that uh, a question there, Rachel, you know, the first contact with AI that the world has had is social media. Right. Yeah. And government government didn't really pay a lot of attention to that or regulators in private before it got huge and started having effects uh, throughout society, both positive and negative. Uh, that's been a learning. Government is not standing uh, behind this. You know, we've been working with the regulators. We actually have specialist teams now in Australia that actually interact with the regulators in Australia. We see a lot of activity in the UK and the EU as well, obviously, with their policy framework. We see the government now stepping a lot more forward into this. And it's not because of just the, the dangers we're talking about, but also the um, the impact on productivity and the impact on jobs, right, which could have far reaching effects in the economy uh, way beyond the scope of this conversation. So, so uh, we, we're encouraged that government is actually allocating time, resources, and being faster in this and creating uh, focus groups on it. Yeah, perfect. Anthony, um, moving on from from this discussion with with government, obviously NAB is a, a very regulated um, 
organisation in terms of um, of that government um, oversight layer. Uh, and I think we can maybe expect some additional government oversight coming down in the future around regulating the use of AI. Um, financial services has obviously been um, flagged as one of the high risk domains under the EU Ethical AI Act and most of the frameworks. So, um, you know, we, we're we all kind of uh, servants to our banks, uh, realistically. We don't really have much choice. We have to opt in to whatever, you know, um, whatever happens in the technology systems and the processes and the paradigms of those organisations in order to exist in, in the economy that we do. So how important is trust in that question? And if we can talk a little bit about that from the NAB point of view, then we might come back to some of these questions in the chat and pick up the thread on those as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, it's a great question. I think what's what's really interesting here is is your point that that sort of trust is central and key. And if I think about it from a from a NAB perspective, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. It's what are we doing and how are we building that trust, but then also how are we interacting with our own ecosystem and the people who are supplying us as a company, and how do we build that trust and understand what's happening there? So, um, if we take that sort of core point of right banking is very much a business of trust but it's also very much a business of data as an example right and so if we to do to fulfill our obligations of trust and the expectations of trust that the community and society and customers have in us we need to ensure that what we're doing is right but also that our supply chain and our vendors mm -hmm. have the right appropriate levels of trust built in and so if we're using the data that is, as an example, that's supplied to us that is not of the appropriate quality, we will then find it harder for us to deliver on that trust promise to our customers. So the way I like to think about that is, you know, anytime, speaking to this now from a sort of B2B perspective, anytime that I want to use data for some specific bank process, such as making a credit decision, when I engage a vendor to get some of that data, we need to make sure that that data is high quality, that it is accurate. It's free from hallucinations. It has no IP or copyright issues. It's free from bias and discrimination. And ultimately that data coming through complies with all of our privacy and data and ethics frameworks. Um, the call out that I think is really interesting is sourcing data that meets those requirements is not a new problem. That's exactly what we do today when we're sourcing that data, um, irrespective of how it's generated. Um, and so on the topic of trust, it's, it's sort of no surprise. I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone to hear that we don't just trust a vendor because, hey, that's Adobe, they're, they're a trust, trust for every company. We're just going to use their data without doing our own due diligence. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Um, so, so the bank has a lot of processes and controls and procedures in place to ensure that the data that we receive is appropriately vetted and fit for purpose. So we can then deliver on our trust promise. Um, so I think the key point that I'm calling there is I don't think there's a specific, certainly in the B2B world, trust advantage at this point in time, because I can see everyone in that ecosystem having the processes and controls in place to ensure trust in the data based on the due diligence rather than the, the brand side of things. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, I think just from my personal experience across startups and corporates, I think particularly when there is a new space and a new technology, corporates will quite often default to it's easier to deal with big, large trusted suppliers than this scrappy little startup who's doing something really interesting um, until they get more familiarity and comfort with that space and that technology. So, so I think, you know, if we talk about which brands will have um, an advantage from that trust premium in the B2B space, I definitely think the larger trusted brands might have a slight advantage and that's more just from a commercial getting things through. But on yeah. the flip side of that, if you think of that whole sort of almost the, the true style Clayton Christensen um, disruption definition, Gen AI and the ability to use it to generate content now for startups and fintechs, as an example, will allow them to play in spaces which are previously off limits and allow them to disrupt some of those larger trusted brands. So I actually mm -hmm. think whatever short term advantage from trust these vendor suppliers have, uh, that will probably diminish quite quickly. Um, yeah. But that's the sort of, I mean, the, the key view, I think, from um, the B2B sort of point of view and how we see the world. I think just as a quick side note on the consumer front and consumer trust in brands, I think that's a really interesting question. And, and I always turn to, it's, 
again, it's not a new problem. And I think traditional market and economics are really going to come into play here, right? And it really depends yeah. on the price premium is going to be directly correlated to the utility of the content and the significance of the use case. So if you're if you're using something to, you know, summarize your WhatsApp messages, you're probably not going to pay much for it. And you're probably going to be pretty, you don't really care if it's where that model comes from because it's not going to be all that impactful. But if I'm using some sort of AI tool to generate a will that covers who's going to have guardianship of my children, I'm probably going to want to have a higher degree of trust in who is supplying that content to me and is it legally valid and is it all the right things? And yes, I probably will pay for it. So I definitely think in the consumer spectrum as well, there's going to be a use case level trust premium that applies. Yeah. Mm. There's a, a follow-up question um, in the chat around this um, uh, for you specifically, and um, I think it's one that's worth just unpicking a little bit. So you mentioned that, you know, um, quality data has been an ongoing problem. As long as we've been sharing information, we've been having to do due diligence on that information. Mm -hmm. Do you think the same uh, DD processes that you currently undertake at the bank will just be adapted for a new kind of DD, or is this a new problem to grapple with? Um, it, it's a really good call out. I think, and I believe the way we're approaching this at NAB is you start from what you know. So we have built these processes over a long period of time and they're pretty robust and they serve uh, the purpose. Uh, but we still then also recognize that this is something new. So we start by applying those processes and those normal due diligence uh, controls that we have, um, but pay particular attention and do a lot of work and thinking about where they might not be fit for purpose and what we might need to do. And yeah. NAB is taking very much in terms of generative AI, a sort of crawl, walk, run approach. And, we, and we're really pushing the innovation lens. What is it that we can do for our customers and our colleagues in this, but what can we do safely? So anything that we start to do in this space where we would potentially be relying on data that might be coming from a generative AI source, um, there's going to be a lot of hypervigilance. And we're not just going to put something straight out without doing that extra level. And we're going to work through that through test and learn those controls. And you know, part of the testing of the new features enables us to test the features as well as to test the controls and the processes that underpin them. Yeah, of course. And I think what we've learned from you know the, the new world we live in, which is breach after breach after breach of security and privacy, um, is that um, people will, um, they will accept uh, being breached and they will move beyond it, but there will be work to do to regain trust in that sense. And what has become the new normal is an expectation that at some point there will be a breach. We're no longer trying to live in a world where we avoid or prevent every breach or spill or you know mishandling of information. Uh, we live in a world where we just seek a, a level of defensibility. So you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the processes we undergo for quality control and DD and security checking are just so that we can say we did do our best. And yes, something slipped through. Yes, there was an impact, but we did try and we did follow established, you know, good practices to try to avoid that impact, uh, which brings me back to Mike. So we had a question in the chat for you first off the bat, um, <laughs> which is directly related to this question. So here we are uh, circling back. So the question was about um, the preventions and controls you're going to put in your products to prevent users creating fake images. Is that something, I mean, you talked about this kind of, you know, concept of, of automatically flagging things that have been um, created with AI, but can we really be preventing this problem? Mm. Are we reducing the likelihood of this risk or are we going to try to focus on reducing the impact of the risk in order to manage it? Well, I think both. Yeah. And it's a really, really great and valid question. Actually, it's something we think a lot about at Adobe. So we talk about, you know, tracking the provenance of images. Of course, you know, that's part of the, the CAI, the Content Authenticity Initiative. But then we have a really robust ethics committee at Adobe as well. So there's a couple of things to understand uh, about the way that we approach AI at Adobe. So first of all, <clears throat> Creative people are our, our, are our core customer. So we're doing everything in our power to protect their IP. And that's sort of part of our um, part of our ethics committee job. It's just part of the way we like to do things at Adobe. So 
the Adobe Firefly models are created in-house and we have no plans to open source, source them. So we have complete control um, over the data set that's used to train those models. So <clears throat> what, we, what we find is if we have fed our, our data set from a stock library of 350 million plus images that, that form uh, the Adobe Stock Library, um, which all of our contributors, as part of their terms and conditions of being contributor, allow us to use that content to train our software with as part of the deal there. Uh, as, well as, as well as that, we've handpicked copyright free and, and uh, copyright expired imagery to train our models with. So our engineering team and our research team have been really thorough about what we put into that model as a training data set. So the first thing that you think about there is, are we going to be able to infringe on people's brands or are we infringing on people's likeness when we're using those models? And the answer is no, uh, because we haven't fed that sort of data into our models to be able to do that. So I couldn't, for example, type in, um, I would like a, a picture of Christian Bale drinking a Coca-Cola, wearing Nike, standing out in front of the Sydney um, Opera House. All of those things are copyrighted or there's someone's likeness. If you type that into Firefly, you will get a pe very poor result. Uh, and that's something that we're actually very proud of uh, because that, that kind of ethical idea around infringing on people's IPs is part of that. As well as that, um, we have a very hands-on human approach to our Firefly models and what goes into the prompt and what comes out of the prompt. So you might find as you're using Photoshop to do generative fill or as you're using Firefly on the web, if you type in certain strings of words, you're not going to get a result out. We will simply block it. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking Firefly to give me an image of this building on fire, it's going to not do that for you. Um, right. So we've put a whole bunch of, you know, kind of blocks in there and guardrails around it. Now we can never stop everyone from doing everything that they want to do, but we're absolutely putting our best effort to kind of show the industry this is how you do it responsibly and this is how you do it ethically. And then bias is a big part of that as well, you know. So if we're thinking about, you know, I would like, a, you know, a skateboarder, you know, rolling down the street. I'm a skateboarder, right? Um, as part of that prompt, I haven't decided, you know, what gender that person is, what race mm -hmm. that person is, all of these considerations that we think about when we talk about bias. So our ethics committee looks at these things and makes sure the generations that we're getting out of our software is really well balanced and really not containing any harmful bias when it comes to these things. So there's a few, there's a, it's a really broad issue, you know, kind of the ethical response to what we're getting out of there. And we've got a really solid committee that works on those sorts of things. And it's not perfect. I, I don't think anything is perfect, but, you know, we want to move forward and show the industry, hey, these are the considerations that you should be really be thinking about when, when, when we're creating these models, when we're using right. them. Yeah, and it might not be perfect, but it is defensible because you can explain the steps that you're taking, you know, and if I did want to go and create a, a copyright, um, you know, likeness of somebody, I mean, you can just close Adobe and go straight to TikTok, right, and generate Tom it's Cruise, you know, <laughs> singing, um, you know, My Heart Will Go On or something. So yeah. I think, you know, yeah. this question will be less about having the blue check mark, like, oh, by the way, there's AI involved in this. I mean, there's AI yeah. involved in my likeness right now. This this Teams call is probably smoothing my wrinkles, right, um, with, without my consent, but I'm okay with it. Um, uh, whereas, you know, what what we might need to see is, 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 in what way the AI has been used in this image. It's not, it, it won't be enough when everything has some kind of AI in it to just say, by the way, there's AI. I think yeah. it'll be the AI yeah, was like used to. What's in that nutrition label. Yeah, yeah. And that's right. certainly part of that, that CAI. It's, it's actually tracking every action that happens there. Yeah. Exactly. 
All right, now we're being overrun by questions in the chat. So I want to make sure that we address some of those. But that was really helpful, Mike. And I think it brings us back to that kind of greenwashing idea of saying, yes, you know, we do generative AI, and, and but we do it in this responsible way. And how much education we need to do to the market to understand what would be irresponsible to do and what wouldn't be and why we've fallen on one side of the line or the other. Um, and I think until people start to kind of get breached by misuse of, of AI information, they might not really understand the implications of just going to TikTok and, you know, creating a deep, a deep fake. Um, okay, so let's have a jump back to some of these questions. And then I want to come back to talking about, um, you know, the, the penultimate um, topic, uh, which is about the role of large tech companies that are already trying to solve some of these problems. And, you know, we'd like to talk um, to you again, uh, Mike, about that and also to Steve. But let's have a look at some of these questions. So one interesting question is, is Gen AI the new black or the new tobacco? Or I might add, is it the new world order? You know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the safety guardrails, and I think, Mike, you've given us a really good rundown of that as well. But I just wonder if, if everybody can just say, you know, if you think this is um, a, a, a net positive, uh, still a high risk, like what is your take? What is the vibe on Gen AI? Is it a necessary evil or is it something that's really going to help us? Maybe Steve, we'll start with you on that. Yeah, so um, we're eternal optimists at Microsoft. So we, you know, we we see the upside in all of this. So, uh, you know, it, it's been, you um, uh, we feel that this is actually going to make a huge evolution and a huge jump in removing a lot of drudgery out of work and moving the perhaps economy to a new position. Uh, we're not, you know, I guess naive about the risks, but we, we see not just a net positive, but a major net positive, like as in orders of magnitude, uh, because we are on some sort of exponential curve. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with that in mind, uh, you know, there's there's downsides with all technology, and I think Rachel, you called out a few of those already. It's it's the new norms. You know, it's the norms that people will start to work with. Uh, it could be, like you said, um, anything you see on the anything that's generated, you, you just have to assume AI, unless it's actually flagged as human created. Might be the the reverse happens over time because of the acceleration, right, um, mm. of of the impact. What uh, we've got to be doing is through education and learning how to use uh, AI to our benefit, looking at the you know the, the different layers of protection, anything from the way you uh, look at AI content and take it at face value all the way to people who build AI <laughs> systems. Um, you know, for example, you know Anthony was talking about the data and the uh, provenance of the data. A, a major technique in controlling hallucinations is to actually use trustworthy data and you apply it against a language model to do its magic, whether it's summarization, whether it's keyword extraction, et cetera. But ultimately, you're uh, restraining the data set that it's working against with uh, the data that you have trust on. Right? So there's a there's a patterns already developed and they're being baked into tools. Um, you know, the the end result is going to be we feel not, you know, um, naive about it, but it's going to be very positive. But I think it's also something that we have to start accepting is not going to go away and educating ourselves um, and being mindful of kind of how the internet came into our lives. You know, it, it, it produced a whole bunch of challenges, right? Could you imagine a bank being on the internet? I mean, I remember explaining to a bank, go on the internet, let people connect to you and uh, <laughs> do their banking. It's like, that is a huge leap of faith, right? And yet it became a norm. And that's because of all the controls and all the security platforms and all those systems that we put into place. And in fact, AI will be used to protect ourselves against AI. So we're finding, you know, that utilizing AI to progress the mandate is going to be very, very important. And it's going to be the mm -hmm. in inspection investors are going to be putting onto future companies. It's like you cannot not use AI. You have to be very yeah. mindful of it, but you, you can't step back from where we are now. Uh, and again, this is probably mostly my opinion, but generally Microsoft's view that we're going to be positive, uh, but we've got to be very mindful about the tooling, the patterns, the the principles that we put into place that, to help educate 
um, and also help build these systems by default to be safe when we get there. Okay. I'll pause here. Maybe others have other views no. as well. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Steve. Um, very insightful. Anthony, I'm going to give you the, the last word of the whole conversation in a minute um, about this idea of a Hippocratic oath. So just sit sit tight on that one for a second and have a think about that. And, and Mike, I, I feel like you are an optimist about AI. I think we, you know, we can tell that from your eyeball looming yes. behind you um, <laughs> creatively. <laughs> Uh, do you think, like overall, what's your what's your vibe? Are you excited about it? Are you worried? Are you excited, tempered with anxiety? And how do you think your experience with your that the background that you have compares to the experience of the average punter who, in another question that's come up, might not have the same kind of AI literacy as you do? Mm. Mm. Well, like I'm nervous because I'm so excited. Uh, I think <laughs> I might be overexcited. Um, <laughs> And just like Steve, you know, we're real optimists at, at Adobe about this. Um, we, you know, we firmly believe that 99.9% .9 of our customers are just, they're doing the right thing. They're doing their jobs. They're representing their brands. They're representing their, their yeah. uh, company, you know, their companies, their organisations. They, they, as creatives, um, have been overrun with more and more and more work that they need to get done for their organization so um you know back in back in the day i was talking about back in the day when i started i was just printing things i was designing things and having them printed and then you know the internet came along so now we've got to keep up with that oh now i've got to do video production for social media now i'm doing 3d assets for the metaverse all of this stuff that the those creative people need to do on a day-to-day -day basis is on this same curve. Uh, and we talk about personalization at scale. So brands wanting to deliver personalized messages to all of their customers. They want to have a one-to-one -one relationship with their customers. That's a difficult thing to do as a graphic designer if you're having to create millions of individual assets for, for, for customers. So it's an absolutely huge positive for our creative customers being able to deliver really, really rich, valuable, engaging content for everyone, you know, uh, to represent their brands in a, in a really, you know, in a really fun, on-brand, you know, creative way. So it's actually freeing them up from doing, you know, some of the drudgery, you know, resizing things for different platforms. All of that stuff can get taken care of and they can get back to that core thing that really drove them to being a, a creative to start with is just being creative, you know, coming yeah. up with things like I did, you know, two seconds before our meeting, just like, oh, I think I'd have, like to have a really big eye as my background today. <laughs> you know, if it's I had to illustrate that. Yeah. yeah. If I had to illustrate that in the past, I'd be doing it last week, you know. So, yeah. um, you know, the ability to be able to be creative and show your creative flair so quickly is a huge thing. So we see that as a massive positive for brands, for organisations, just for visual communication in general, you know, whether it's through video yeah. or 3D or, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah, huge fans over it, a massive upside for our customers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're I think you're really right that um, most of us are operating in good faith. And mm. I think most individuals um, in the kind of information economy, sorry, I, I believe one of my children has just woken up, so apologies in advance. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> um, it's very early to be waking up. Um, <laughs> so so and I think um, that part of the the issue might be that the, the bad faith actors aren't going to be using um, commercial licensed versions of Adobe, right? Mm. So, so it's it's good for us to build in those controls, knowing that most of the users of our technology want to be doing the right thing anyway, and the ones who don't are going to get around it regardless. They'll be pirating and jailbreaking and, and developing their own um, technology, and that's something that we have to be prepared for as well. Um, I just want to quickly talk about the question that's come up a few times in the thread about international standards just with my own perspective. So I, I designed an AI um, technology back in the, the late 20 teens, which seems like a long time ago now. And at the time, there was no legislation for ethical AI. But what there was on a dusty hidden corner of the internet was the Australian government ethical AI framework 
which of course, as an auditor, I thought, great, I will incorporate this into my giant requirements catalogue when I develop my solution. So at that time, because of that framework existing, which was a voluntary code, you know, with really no uh, force behind it, um, we, we built a paradigm from scratch that was explainable and ethical, which has turned out really well for us now, I have to say, um, when these when these these standards finally turn into legislation and regulation after enough market pressure, um, it is helpful to have seen them and recognised them. So I just wanted to give the feedback that these voluntary codes and these standards, they come from good places, they come from academic research, they come from industry engagement. And yes, they might be voluntary and yes, they might seem a bit ephemeral, but it's really important now to have that eye on the future. So whenever we see these standards pop up uh, across any advanced economy, I think we should be looking at them and thinking about hedging uh, for them rather than against them. Okay, we only have um, uh, fewer than 10 minutes left. And Anthony, I wanted to come back to this, this kind of curly final question that probably everyone has been uh, waiting to hear about. Um, the, the potential adverse effects for individuals can be really significant. And we've seen this, we know this in the privacy and cyberspace with information. We know that individuals have lost their lives because of mishandling of information. We know individuals have been deported. We know they've been unlawfully detained. We know they've had their rights removed or compromised. We know they've been disenfranchised in our communities because of mishandling of information. And that's another panel for another time. But we, we know essentially that we can cause significant harm by our actions and our inactions with information. So how do we how do we do no harm? Noting the things we've discussed throughout the panel, the fact that bad actors are going to bad act, right? How do we how do we deal with that? Knowing that technology is continually advancing and we're trying to keep up, knowing that government tends to be slower in understanding and adapting to and regulating technology. Is there kind of a you know, a model, and we talked about before, maybe the EU ends up owning this problem or the UN ends up owning this problem. Is there a model where we're going to have a Hippocratic Oath? And if we do, what would it look like? Who would sign up to it? Um, what do you see the future looking like for that? Look, I think I think my view on that is, <clears throat> I think we can all agree very much on the intent behind the suggestion of something like a Hippocratic Oath. And, and it's, you know, there are, you just listed a whole series of very interesting ethical points that apply to, to the use of generative AI and AI in general. Um, you know, personally from someone working in the bank, the one that sort of keeps me up at night and has me thinking is how do we use these tools to actually protect our most vulnerable customers more and then deliver things better for them and keep them safe rather than potentially inadvertently having adverse impacts on them. So it, it's definitely something that we need to think through and, and work through. Um, I do, however, personally question where something like a, an oath would be actually practical or effective in that, um, even if we separate out the bad actors who are obviously not going to be taking any sort of oath, <laughs> certainly not without their fingers crossed behind the back, right? Um, but I think I think there is, I always go from starting from what we know, and I think MAB certainly has the view of, you know, start working within the regimes and the policies and the regulation that you have right now. So if I think about all the work that I'm doing exploring generative AI at MAB, all of that work is governed by all the existing regulation that NAB has to follow as a bank. It's mm. governed by our risk management frameworks. It's governed by our privacy policy. It's governed by our data ethics principles. So again, I keep on coming out to the scene. It, it's a new spin on something, but it's not something new. We've got it, patterns and experience in dealing with these sorts of spaces before. So that's always a really good starting point. And I think to the point we said earlier is when you do something new, you spend extra time and effort looking at it as you do the new test and learn and, and safe innovation to see if there are gaps and how they can sort of be filled in and what, and you know, okay, now we found a thing that a potential uh, channel that is not really covered. How do we best solve that? Is that a policy? Is that a regulation? Is that a, just a, another part of our data, data ethics? I think. If you have that as your starting point, the other point that I think where we um, can be really effective is probably a few more practical things than an oath. Um, you know, as an example, I believe NAB is supporting of supportive of the concept of more like government certification of industry standards mm -hmm. around the sort of safe and, and responsible use of AI, which you know could be based on existing AI ethics and principles. So something along those lines could actually really be a bit more toothy than a, uh, or sort of more standardized than, than an oath. Um, 
And another area that I think would be quite interesting is actual practical development of tools to enable the ethical use of these sorts of technologies, rather than just saying, hey, I, I scouts on, I'm going to do good. So I, I don't mean to be flippant in saying a, a Hippocratic oath is like scouts on it, but rather than just you know, the, the intent, what are the tools that will help people do that? You know, yeah. uh, as an example, NAB's been sort of partnering with the Australian Human Rights Commission to actually develop an AI human rights impact assessment tool, which is for when banks are starting to do things that it actually lets people who are developing those processes and tools use the tool to inform the conversation and explore all the areas they need to. So, so I think practical application of tools and of standards and starting with existing regulatory framework is expanded probably in my mind a better starting point than thinking through oaths, but I'm certainly not mm -hmm. ruling that out. I just think that's a good point to start. Yeah, I'd agree. I think we've done we've done significant work by we, I mean the royal we of uh, of regulators and uh, and government particularly of um of sharpening the big stick of cyber and privacy over the last five to ten years. Uh, just like we now have um, ethical AI is kind of nascent. There was a time where taking privacy and cybersecurity seriously, if you weren't a national security agency, was kind of a nascent idea as well. But now we have the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act. We have revisions to the Privacy Act and the expansion of the scope of that. And we're quite good now, I think, at wielding that stick. Um, and, and perhaps, like you mentioned, privacy law already includes some of these facets that are relevant to the ethical use of AI. So maybe those end up being the vehicles that we use to try to support and manage and enforce this oath, um, such as it is, while we're building and developing separate regulation and legislation, if we, if we do. Um, Okay, so we've only got a few minutes uh, left. Alison, was there a particular wrap up that you'd like to do? Do I need to leave you a couple of minutes to uh, close yeah, up the just session? A couple of minutes is great. Thank you. Perfect. All right, well, over to you, Alison. I think we haven't quite got through all the questions in the chat, but it's certainly been an incredibly interesting conversation. Yeah, definitely. And um, thank you so much to our speakers today. It's been great. Some of the things that I'm going to be thinking about, um, maybe not uh, Anthony during the night like you worry about <laughs> some of your things I might think of it before I fall asleep. Uh, but I really enjoy hearing about the provenance, that blue check mark of Gen AI, is it still relevant when we start to self-certify, um, putting Gen AI into the public domain, we're creating that dialogue that is really needed to create inherent safety. How do we train those models whilst ensuring control factors, including control over the data sets that we use to train? Um, it's great to hear there's a broad consensus, consensus that in the commercial sector that regulation of Gen AI is vital and necessary. And I think um, one of the things I really loved was how do we utilise this tech to help our most vulnerable communities rather than inadvertently causing harm by using this technology. Um, given the speed at which Gen I is evolving, uh, we anticipate internally at the RTA that we'll be revisiting this topic again in the first half of 2024. And no doubt there'll be completely new content uh, to discuss then. Deb, our CEO, has just run an event in New York today and is running a regulatory roundtable next week in Washington, D.C., and this topic is front and centre at those events as well. So thank you again to our speakers. It's been really informative and really, really appreciate you giving your time to come and discuss your views. I also just wanted to take a second to tell you about some events that are coming up next. We have, uh, Deb and I are going to be at Singapore FinTech Festival from the 15th to the 17th of November. We're part of the Austrade Team Australia delegation and Deb's also speaking at the event. So reach out if you're going to be in town because we would love to catch up with you. Our last public event for the year is on 30th November. It's one of our RegTech Edge No Borders events and it's on cyber and information security risk. And for our members who are online, don't forget we have our member-only AGM on the 22nd of November. So please reach out to the team if you have any questions about the AGM. So thank you again for joining us today. It's been a great event and thank you again to our speakers and we look forward to seeing you at our next event.